Right, we are live. Good afternoon, everyone, and sorry for the delay. Um, we have had um, major issues caused by me not being able to read which page I'm looking at. Uh, so apologies for that. So um, we're back with the latest of the community demos, first one for 2016. We've got a great schedule set up. We should still be able to fit it within the hour. Um, so I'm going to crack straight on and give you some quick updates from me. We'll, we'll shave some time off my section since that was my mistake. Um, so I'm just going to tell you very quickly, if you've uh, not been uh, living under a rock for the past month, you probably already know all this stuff already. But very quickly, we have quite a lot of events coming up in the next month. So um, first of all, there's FOSDEM uh, in just over a week's time uh, in Brussels. So if you're going to be there, we will have a stand in K building. So please come down and say hi, introduce yourself. Um, we'll have a chat. We've got demos. We've got swag. Come see us. If you're staying for FOSDEM, you might also be aware of Config Management Camp. Um, so that's the two days after FOSTEM. We have our own track at Config Management Camp. So uh, lots of great formula-related content coming up on those two days. Following that, we have the Form and Construction Day. Uh, this is a contributor summit, if you like. So it's a chance to, to take the four days we've just had of discussions and turn that into something uh, more hack-related. So we're going to have a um, bit, of, bit of chat about the big problems that we need to solve and then some hack time. Um, so good, good opportunity to, to get contributing to Foreman if you're already a contributor to come and work on the stuff you're interested in. If you're not already a contributor, come anyway, learn how to be one. Uh, so that should be pretty awesome. And then um, if you're not dead by the end of that, uh, then we'll also be at DevConf as well. So um, so DevConf is, uh, is a regular feature. Uh, it's a couple of days after Config Management Camp in Brno in the Czech Republic. So uh, if you're going to be in that area, uh, again, we will have a stand. Uh, come and have a chat with us. Um, the only other notable thing I've been on in the last month or two, you may remember a blog post regarding uh, GitHub review culture. Uh, there is a dashboard. Um, if you're interested in playing with it, this is a bit small font, but the key thing here is that this is a list of patches ordered by how old they are. So it's an opportunity to go and see across all our repos um, what is the current set of things that have been left for quite a long time and possibly need someone to go back and poke them a little bit. So if you're interested in doing the odd bit of reviewing, this might be a good way to get started. Um, also, if you're interested in reviews and you're not too familiar with it, check out the developer handbook on the website. It gives you lots of information there. So um, that's me really, really quickly. Um, I'm going to move straight on to Ori, who is going to tell us all about uh, what she's been doing with parameters. So if you're good to go, Ori, we'll cross over to you. Hey, uh, I'll do it quick also. Uh, I'm only going to show location and organizations today. And the changes here are exactly like what we have in host group. So it should it, it's exactly the same. I'll just show it here. So in locations, uh, now under parameters, this is a parameter. Uh, a location that doesn't have a parent, so you only see its parameters. But if I go to its child, then I'll see in parameters its parent parameters, and I can override them uh, from here, and I'll see that it's overridden and remove it. Also, if I add a parameter with the same name, and I'll save that, then it will also be overridden. I'll just get to that again. And I can see its parameter. Uh, I can see that it was overridden. Uh, and if I switch parents, then the parameters will be updated for the new parents. It said secret here before it said uh, TLV. And it's exactly the same thing with uh, organizations. That's it. Superb. Thanks very much, Ori. Um, so um, we'll move straight on from there. Uh, I just need to fix my screen sharing so you can see the slides. There we go. Um, so moving on from Ori, we've now got Daniel, who's going to give us a little bit of a look at uh, what's coming up in the next version of Foreman with regards to the UI. Daniel, over to you. Oh, he, Daniel apparently has a problem. We will come back to him. So. Next up, it's Ivan and Marek, who are going to talk to us a little bit about remote execution. 
So let me share my screen. I hope the sound is okay. Uh, so we would like to show you the latest updates on the remote execution that we've got in the uh, current iteration. So first of all, I would like to show you an ability to render one template from another and do some composition of job templates that one could use uh, uh, then for uh, remote execution. So I've used here a simple uh, example. I will increase the font a bit. Uh, I hope it's readable, but you don't have to, have to focus on the content of the template. This is a template for installing Foreman, uh, and I have some uh, inputs defined version of the Foreman to install admin password and uh, install args. So this is a uh, plain template that, as you, as you know it before, and if I use this, I would be able to install Foreman using remote execution. So what was added is ability to use this kind of templates for uh, kind of derivatives. So here I have a template that is uh, installing Foreman with remote execution. And as you can uh, expect, it calls Foreman installer and other things um, and passes some arguments needed for enabling the remote execution here. So uh, Ivan, don't forget you need a fairly large um, font for showing this stuff. Okay, let's switch to mobile version. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Great, thanks. So uh, there was a new keyword introduced in the template. First argument is the uh, name of the template you want to include here. And the second parameter, one can pass the inputs or values for the inputs to be used. So here I pass in for the installer arguments, uh, switches for enabling the uh, remote execution. And I can also uh, include the other arguments that will pass as a user input. So how it's achieved this is in the job. Uh, we have a concept of foreign input set. So instead of just in defining the input, I can basically reference and encode another uh, set of inputs inside the template. So I'm saying that I want to use the inputs from the install format, and I want to include all of the arguments there. So when I go then uh, to the, or maybe I can just re-render that because uh, it will be faster. So if I show that, uh, so how it translates this render template, it will render the, the original template with inputting the uh, inputs that I've provided. So you can see that I have the uh, enable remote execution plus at the end I still have the ability to pass installer arcs. So when I go and try to install something uh, where remote execution or run an arbitrary command, it doesn't look uh, obviously uh, limited to the installation. So remote, you can see I have here that install format template with some inputs required. And then I have, when I switch to install format with remote execution, you can see the inputs stay the same. So if I edit some new input in the install format, it would automatically get into the install format with remote execution. So this is one way for, for doing so, and it's uh, useful for reusing templates uh, for other purposes. There is also ability when including some templates or inputs uh, to define if I want to include all inputs or just uh, some of them, or I want some inputs to be excluded from, uh, from this one. So I have here a second template, uh, which is basically the same as the previous one, but, but I'm not exposing the installer arcs at all. So here I'm passing all the inputs uh, manually and not using any uh, input set here. And what it does then when I switch uh, with, to the simple version, that you can see I have no, uh, no question asked here uh, regarding the foreman, and everything will be uh, specified explicitly. Uh, I want to show this, that uh, it's not useful only for the remote execution and including the inputs, but it could be also used for extending the current snippet uh, implementation with ability to pass 
values for some inputs defined. So you can see here it works. Uh, uh, let's switch to is this the simple version. Yeah. So uh, it works the same. You can see I have the inputs defined. So that's everything from my side, and I will turn over to Marek. All right, thanks very much, Ivan. So yeah, let's stick with the remote execution, and Marek, it's over to you. OK, uh, so I would like to show a few changes uh, from the usability category of stuff we worked on. So let me start with uh, one change. Uh, we started to ship some default roles, so if you want to uh, narrow down the permissions for the users uh, regarding what job templates or what jobs they can start. We provide two roles here, remote execution manager and remote ex execution user. So you can simply see what uh, permissions are required for that. And uh, you could also specify uh, specific job uh, jobs that can be triggered by the user by the standard permissions or standard, standard filters we have in Foreman. Um, so I can show the filter here, and I can specify the name of the template that can be run. And for example, uh, a host or host group even. I don't want to go into details here. We have this documented in manual. There are some things that uh, one has to be aware of. But you can find it in our manual under uh, 4.3 permission delegation topic. Um, so another uh, changes on our job invocations page. Um, we got the documentation button here that links to our manual. It's also on job templates page, thanks to uh, Daniel. Um, we have uh, changed the status column here. So we introduced uh, a set of four statuses, four possible values here. Uh, one you can see is queued, which means the job invocation is scheduled into future. Um, then we can have the running here with the progress and uh, succeeded or failed, which tells you the result. Um, then we added the start column here. So before the change, it was used only for uh, future uh, executions. Now we share the same column for uh, the information about when it started or in case of, of this future execution, which is queued, there's a time when it should start. We use uh, words uh, instead of uh, specific time information, but if you hover over that, you'll get the exact time. Um, you can use the status also for filtering. So it's, as I said, we have four of them. So you can do queries like status is succeeded. Uh, we also provide some default bookmarks here. So for example, a recent one is interesting. So that's, oops. Yeah. So um, that finds all uh, invocations uh, that started uh, during the last day. And you can uh, combine that with status. So you can find all failed um, in a specific uh, time period. Um, OK, and uh, let's go to the job templates page now. So here, again, the documentation button, as you can see. The biggest change that happened here is in the form. So um, there used to be two name uh, attributes here, the template name. And then there was a name under uh, job here called job name. So that's gone now. It was replaced by the job category. And uh, it's always set to, the, to this value by default. So if you don't want to use job categories, you can just skip this completely. Uh, currently, it's used for uh, easier navigation through the job templates. So you can basically group your templates under some uh, categories. Those we ship by default, which are uh, package action, puppet run, run command, and service action, have their own uh, job category. But uh, you can create your own categories easily. You just go to the to the form and change the value here. It's still the auto completion field, so you can here select existing one or just type a new one. Um, we also have the run button here, so you can go to the catalog of your job templates and just click run button. So let me just uh, run ping, for example. And it will select the 
template and the category automatically for you. Uh, you can still change the job template you want to run. So uh, let's run some command. Um, and uh, here we used to have uh, multiple providers and uh, template selection, which is also removed uh, and replaced by the job category. So all the time you have to uh, select a category and then select explicitly the template from the category that you want to run. Um, yeah. So let's do some command. Uh, also in this form, we extracted the schedule into a separate tab. Uh, but then we realized it would be better to be in the same form. So it's back here uh, as a schedule, and you can change um, the, the scheduling here. Let's do it execute now. And the last change we did was here in the host uh, table. So the most wanted feature was actually changing the links here. So the name of the of the host here uh, gives you the page of detail of that ex execution instead of the uh, host detail page. And you can still find the, the link to the host detail here. Um, so I think that's it. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Mara. OK, we will uh, cycle back to Daniel now, I think, who uh, has managed to join the call. And uh, he's going to give us a look at the, the Patternfly UI changes that are upcoming. Over to you, Daniel. OK, uh, okay so I'll start with uh, shoulder changes first instead, because it, I mean, it's going to be like a minute for, for both. All right. So. Uh, Shoulder is a TED framework uh, that I uh, added recently, like a few, two or three weeks ago. And what it adds basically is um, a lot of matchers um, that allow you to test things like validation and sort of basic controller functionality. Um, these are some of the matchers that you, that you can use. Uh, you have things like uh, validate, well, matches for different val validators. And then you have um, also ways of checking whether uh, a controller action work, works well or not with uh, things like when templates and so forth. Um, when I added this, I also changed uh, some of the formant tests to use this. So I'm going to show you a little bit. Uh, how it looks like, um, and I'm just don't, don't forget to zoom in. That's very small font. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, uh, one small change that you may have noticed already, uh, because it, it caused uh, some trouble with uh, Jenkins and Foreman tasks, is that uh, all of the um, tests that you should just do a get in the index and check that a template index was uh, shown is now uh, done by just this line, basic index text. Uh, same for new and same for, ed for edit, which is pass um, uh, an instance of the object, of the object uh, being te tests. Um, and for modules, uh, basically what this test framework uh, provides it uh, just instead of actually saving the object and, and doing uh, the whole thing of creating creating an object, checking that some property some property um, works with uh, validation. What this does is it, it just goes to the um, to the active regular uh, model and checks uh, whether the validation is present or not and. If, if the validation is defined in the object, it doesn't go further than, than that. Uh, so it saves us, um, it, it should save us uh, some time um, on these tests. Because before, we were hitting the database, uh, in this case, three times. And in, in this case, for instance, outsource LDAP, uh, we, well, now we're only uh, hitting the database in three tests versus uh, a lot more. Anyway, uh, I just wanted you to be aware that you, now you can use this to to test um, 
validations and, and controllers. Uh, it's called Shulda Context. Um, for Pythonfly, uh, I'm guessing most of you have noticed already if you are running uh, for an out of the developed branch. Uh, we have uh, updated from Bootstrap 3.3 to Pythonfly 2.8. Um, the reason being basically that Pythonfly is a project that brings, um, well, they did some uh, user testing with uh, common things that um, that enterprise applications have, like alerts, uh, tables, and so forth, and they tried to find a way to um, to give some patterns that uh, work best with people. So we've migrated the form into to it. Um, if you are adding new functionality to Foreman, I would suggest you to go to patternfly.org, uh, then to the patterns um, tab, and then you can see here uh, things like, for instance, if you have a, um, uh, let's say, uh, you are adding a new type of model, and this model doesn't exist in the database yet, well, an empty um, table shouldn't be shown. Instead, you should show something like this. Um, that, that's just an example. Um, yeah, there is not much to say about it. Uh, you probably started noticing changes. Uh, just uh, try to adhere to the rules that you can uh, find in patternfly.org. And uh, also, I think, Yesterday, uh, the first nightly with with Pyronfly came out. So if you can try it in in production and you see anything that doesn't look how it should, how it should uh, just report report any bugs and we'll fix it. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Daniel. Uh, it's probably worth mentioning the the pattern fly stuff is uh, is just look and feel. So if anyone's not familiar with it, hasn't seen it coming. Um, all those menu items are still where you expect them to be. Uh, it's it's just mm -hmm. just the uh, the CSS, right? It's just how it looks. Okay, um, so that's great. Uh, we're going to move on to a a collection of smart proxy updates now. Uh, so we're going to start with Toma, uh, who is uh, is going to tell us uh, all about what he's been doing with the status page uh, and an overview of the smart proxy status page. So over to you, Toma. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, so the small proxy... Bit bigger. Bit bigger. <laughs> there we go, perfect. Okay, so the small proxy page has seen quite a bit of uh, overall over the last few weeks. Uh, first off, the index uh, has a new status column, and you can see proxy status. Uh, this, can, this gets updated when you refresh the page. So in case one of the proxies goes down, you can immediately see the status is down uh, with a tooltip showing whatever uh, you have. And um, if you click on the proxy name, you go to a proxy status page. Uh, this page is uh, made up of several tabs, uh, and its content is dependent on the features activated on the proxy. So, for example, I'll be showing you a proxy that has uh, several features activated, the TFTP, the HCP, Puppet, and Puppet CA. Um, I can see the communication status with the proxy is active. Uh, the version that's running the proxy, the URL, features, I can refresh the features. And you see that, yeah, the proxy is still running those same features. Um, all of the data on this, these pages is cached, so uh, in case you make some changes to the proxy and you don't see them here, you will need to refresh either from here or refresh the features. It uh, invalidates the cache. Um, so this tab will have more details depending on which uh, features you have active. Uh, other features will have other sections added to this tab. The services tab displays uh, some services that uh, just uh, have very little information, so we didn't think they needed the tab of their own. Uh, some of them may in the future be split off into more tabs. Some will stay services. 
Again, you can see the version, uh, some relevant data, if there's some subnets on that uh, DHCP server, uh, TFTP server for the TFTP proxy. Um, very basic information, for, so you can see the status for features, that, even if they don't get updated yet, to provide more data. Uh, next up is uh, Puppet. Uh, Puppet tab has two sub tabs. The general tab shows, again, the version that's running on the proxy, the number of hosts managed, and that is a link to a host search that displays all the hosts that have this Puppet master setup. Um, some oh, some of uh, these charts, which you may recognize from the main dashboard, but this is filtered only for that Puppet master. So if uh, ho a host isn't configured to use this Puppet master, it won't show up in this chart. Right now, there's nothing interesting. Um, and another tab that has environments. This allows you to see what environments are set up on the Puppet Master, as well as the number of classes uh, that each environment contains, again, with a link to the classes, Puppet classes that are on that environment. Uh, next up is the Puppet CA tab. The Puppet CA tab also has tabs in it. The first one is the general, again, version host managed, similar to Puppet, and this is uh, a new thing that came with Butterfly that Daniel mentioned earlier is the cards. We have uh, info cards that give us a nice layout to see various data about the host or whatever. Uh, so here we can see the number, the total number of certificates managed by that Puppet CA, the number of pending certificates, the number of valid certificates, and the number of revoked certificates. Each of these link to the relevant status in the Certificates tab, which we'll see in a second. You can also see the expiry date of the CA certificate. So once that expires, it will actually revoke all the certificates, so you would, would need to know about that. Um, the numbers here don't add up because for some reason some of the certificates don't have a state. I'm not sure why, uh, but they should. Hopefully. Um, and finally, you can see the number of auto sign entries that are set up on the Puppet CA, and you can actually click the plus button and add a new auto sign entry. Um, the certificates tab has a list the diff that can be filtered. See all the certificates on the uh, proxy. You can filter by state. For example, if you want to see the free. Uh, certificates that for some reason don't have a state. You can see them. You can delete a certificate. If a certificate is pending, you can sign it from this uh, view. You can also just use the search to filter the table. For example, uh, if you want to see proxy.local domain, just filters the table. Uh, next up is the auto sign entries. Again, a very simple table. You have a search here, and you can delete an entry. Yes, I'm sure I'll delete the entry, and this will reload the auto sign entry page. Uh, and the entry is deleted. Again, if I add a new one, gets added. Uh, most of this is loaded via Ajax, so the initial page load is very fast, and then any calls to the proxy are handled by Ajax. Um, so I think this is it, unless there are some questions. Uh, no, I think we're going to have to move on there. We're running tight on time. Um, so thank you very much, Tama. That's looking pretty shiny. Um, so uh, next up, I think it's Lukash, who uh, again on the proxy, we're going to talk a bit about logging. So Lukash, it's over to you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, in this sprint, uh, I was working on improving uh, visibility of proxy. Uh, new user 
new users and newcomers uh, and unexperienced users usually struggle uh, when they experience uh, issues with provisioning and, for example, catalog plugin with uh, pulp. And uh, our task, our vision is to improve visibility and, and tell them more uh, if they don't know what they need to connect to the smart proxy and investigate logs. So uh, I've created a small API the, on the smart proxy side, which is called slash logs. And uh, what it does, it's essentially a log buffer. Uh, um, Implement is a two uh, buff buffer, uh, uh, circle buffers or ring buffers. And so it gives you a latest last uh, N events, a last N logs uh, in the buffer, so you can fetch them. And it also, uh, as a second thing, it also uh, hooks into the initialization of the modules, smart proxy modules, and it, it gives you a list of modules that failed initial initializations uh, with their uh, with the messages of uh, of the exceptions that were raised. So this API is very simple and provides two things. Each, each message, as you can see, has, has a timestamp and level and message itself, and optionally backtrace. Uh, so this is the smart proxy part, and now the UI part. Uh, you may notice that the, I have a different tabs here. This is because we are working different tabs than Tomer. This is because we are working in parallel, so this hasn't been merged yet into the smart uh, into the uh, former nightly. So the first the 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 the, the List of failed modules is presented currently on, on the details page on, on the overview tab. So you can see uh, instead of features list, uh, I've changed this to active features. These are the features that uh, that started uh, uh, properly. And I have a list of disabled features or uh, faulty features. Uh, so these, in, in my case, these are two. Uh, this is an unreleased uh, 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 plugin, but we know uh, we know Puppet very well, and uh, the hover over it uh, shows you the, uh, the the error message. So if I click on that, this would take me to the logs page. This is the new new tab uh, I've created. As you can see, this is pretty much simple. It shows you what was fetched uh, via the API on the call from the smart proxy. As you can see, there are two. Um, these widgets, uh, status widgets, or how, how they are called, and I eventually move them to overview or, or services uh, tab uh, because it takes a lot of space. So uh, working with the table is pretty, pretty much straightforward. You can list, you can uh, filter things out. Uh, I've noticed that Tomer implemented filtering via the combo uh, drop-down. I have this icon, so you can cycle through various, uh, you know, uh, error warnings and, and all the you know, all the uh, yeah, messages. So I likely change that to to be on par uh, with uh, Tomer's uh, implementation. And also, uh, you can of course filter by by text. Uh, uh, and of course, you can uh, you can click on the on the dashboard widgets, so this this will filter out your warning messages, error messages, and also um, if there is a there is a message that has backtrace information with it, there is this uh, puzzle icon here, and you can always click on a detail and see the whole time level of message and backtrace uh, in this dialog model dialog. Uh, so if there's no backtrace, the, the, the dialogue is shorter. Uh, and this is uh, the, the, basically the same information as uh, you've seen on the overview page. Uh, this six out of eight modules are operational, and two modules, Koi and Puppet, uh, are, uh, are, were disabled. So if you click on that, this will filter out your uh, Koi and uh, Puppet text from the log messages. It's as simple as that. And uh, log entries are are uh, cached as well. So in case you want to refresh and see new uh, new logs, you need to click on refresh. And uh, initial I think setting is three minutes. You can change change that in the in the in the settings global settings. This is common for all the tabs here in this in this smart proxy detail. Last thing I want to mention is. By default, the buffer is configured with, for uh, 1,500 messages, and it keeps and it keeps 500 
errors. Uh, so if, even if there are more than a uh, thousand uh, info or debug messages, it keeps the latest last uh, 500 messages, you know, in the buffer. That's that's the reason why there are actually two ring buffers, and you can con configure that. Of course, I did some testing, and it looks like the whole buffer. If you fetch that uh, full buffer, uh, I can show you. I can simulate um, simulate. Uh, some log information. I, if, if I refresh the whole buffer of uh, thousand, thousand and fifty, five hundred uh, logs, is about is about uh, two hundred and fifty uh, kilos. to the, the request. So it's not that big. So it's a it's a decent uh, decent uh, decent uh, starting point. So you can configure that. And one more thing, I've implemented very small. A very small uh, plugin, smart proxies underscore tail, which hooks, uh, which you can configure, and it's essentially a tail. Uh, so you can configure a regular expression and polling interval and uh, files you want to watch. It's something like watchdogs, uh, and it sends those uh, lines into the log, into the buffer, not in, not into the smart proxy log, log, of course, but into the buffer only. So, uh, so actually, this is this what you see here is I generated some fake uh, in, uh, error messages, uh, as you can see. This is coming from the foreman underscore tail. This hasn't been published yet, but it's a small plugin. I'll I'll push uh, to GitHub uh, this week. I want to also impl implement a small uh, button here, uh, expire messages. So if you if you click on that, uh, Foreman will rem remember the latest um, timestamp, and the API supports from timestamp uh, uh, options. So if you provide that, you can easily filter out uh, messages you are not interested in. Uh, so I think this is it. Thanks very much, Lukas. Uh, just to clarify, this is not merged yet, right? This is this is still in development. Yeah, exactly. Both smart proxy side and US side, but uh, it's uh, almost ready. Okay, cool. I just thought, you know, because we normally do show committed stuff, I thought I'd flag that to people. And if obviously if they're interested yeah. in in contributing to that design, then now is a good time to to go and throw their thoughts out there. Um, okay, thanks so much, Lukash. So um, moving on, we are going to have Andre, um, who is going to bring us some information uh, on a similar theme, uh, but about pulp this time. So Andre, it's over to you. Hi. Uh, as a part of proxy visibility tasks, we wanted to uh, expose what's going on with pulp and pulp storage. So let me share my screen. I hope you can see it, and it's big enough. So this is actually Shlomi's work, and since he's not available, We don't see your screen, Andre. You don't see my screen? Oh, hang on. No, oh, there it comes. But you do need to zoom in just a little bit. OK. Uh, is this better? Yeah, that'll do. Thanks very much. Uh, OK, so this is actually Shlomi's work, but he's not available today. So I was asked to show what he's done with the pub storage. As you can see in the Smart Proxy show page, uh, uh, there is a nice colored bar that shows uh, how much space we have for, um, for pub content. Uh, it uh, monitors uh, the directories uh, uh, these directories. Uh, if uh, each directory is on a separate partition, you have uh, multiple bars for each of those uh, folders. Uh, the, uh, the color is changed when uh, you're running out of out of space, uh, and if you're you have plenty of space, it turns green. Also, there is additional information on pulp in the services tab. This is actually uh, the version of uh, Smart Proxy Pulp plugin. This is uh, a Pulp server version. We can see that our database connection is OK. Uh, messaging is also working, and there are 30 Pulp, pulp workers. So yeah, that's, that's about it, really. OK, thanks very much. Nice and quick. Glad to see that. Um, that's great. So uh, the final um, round of proxy updates, I believe, is coming from uh, Tomash, uh, who's going to show us a bit more pulp stuff, but uh, this time sync status rather than disk status. So Tomash, it's over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, another piece of, uh, uh, of pulp uh, status that we are adding into into catalog uh, that should help with uh, debugging uh, 
uh, some problems uh, that might appear in the content synchronization. Uh, just a, a warning, my stuff is also not merged yet. It's, uh, it's a pull request, so I'm showing it rather to uh, collect some feedback and also possibly attract people uh, to help with, uh, with the review. Um, so this is the uh, proxy proxy detail detail page. Uh, this this is a brand new proxy that's just been registered into the foreman. So it has no lifecycle environment assigned yet. Uh, we can see there's a new new panel uh, with info about synchronization. Uh, it shows that the capsule is synchronized because there's nothing to sync uh, actually, and. Uh, last sync time uh, says never. Uh, there's a button button that could trigger the synchronization, but I'll leave this for later. Uh, there was, uh, there's a new tab edit also with content, uh, and it should display uh, all the content that's actually on the on the proxy, not only what's uh, what's expected there to be. Uh, so and now it's it's also empty because because no. Uh, no environment uh, has been assigned. So now I'm going to assign some lifecycle environment. So this library submitted. And I'm going to refresh the page. It's going to take some time because my devil machine with catalog is a rather slow one. Well, uh, in the meantime, I could show you how it uh, how it looks when something goes wrong with the synchronization. When you start the synchronization, uh, there's a progress bar that ap appears, and it uh, actually actively pulls the server and shows the shows the progress uh, live. Uh, and when something goes wrong, you can see the uh, see the error messages here, uh, and also you can click uh, you can click the progress bar. Uh, to show all the all the tasks that's uh, all the foreman tasks that's been uh, executed on on the proxy, uh, so that you can you can debug it a bit deeper. Here it is, and I will also sh uh, yeah I'll switch back to this this original proxy. Uh, now you see that it says that one environment can be synchronized uh, because it's detected there's some uh, some new content to sync and still uh, still shows uh, that last thing has not been uh, there's no no last thing uh, on the content tab there's a new environment library and when I open it I can see all the uh, content views uh, in the uh, in the environment. Some details about them and what's on the uh, what's on the proxy. Uh, you see some you see all zeros because nothing uh, was synchronized. When I go to this one that's been synchronized before, you see there's uh, more uh, more environments and some some real data that come from uh, from from the proxy. So uh, I'll try to hit hit the synchronize button. Uh, we'll see what happens because. Uh, Lately, I had some troubles with my, with my, yeah, uh, with my puppet. Uh, so there's been a, uh, there's been some some issue. We got the idea, though. But yeah, but you got the idea. It's star synchronization. You can cancel it by the way. So yeah, that's it. That's it from my side. Cool. Okay. Thanks very much, Tomas. Uh, so that's a nice collection of proxy updates. Just to, to reiterate what you see there, um, the the framework in the form and UI is merged, but uh, all the various tabs, Puppet, Pulp, TFTP, and so on, I think. Uh, no, TFTP is merged. The Puppet ones are not. The logging ones are not, and the Pulp ones are not yet. But um, it's not far off. Uh, you'll see that in, a, in the near future. Um, and uh, in the meantime, if you've got any suggestions to make that even more awesome, then you can do so. Okay, so um, lastly, and just in time, um, we've got Martin, who is going to give us uh, a little bit uh, of an update on what's been happening in the world of the installer. So uh, Martin, it's over to you. 
Hi, I've shared my terminal. Uh, so yesterday was released new uh, major major version of uh, Kafka library that uh, includes uh, support for scenario uh, install scenarios and also for scenarios migrations uh, that I will demo today. Uh, migrations are good for uh, case when you want to upgrade your installer and you want to uh, add some new uh, modules or new parameters to your uh, to your scenarios. So I'll show you how the data are organized. Okay, so this is uh, this is uh, a list of uh, directory where the install configuration is stored. Uh, you can see uh, some scenario and answer files, and uh, there is also a scenario for a smart proxy here. And you can see that there is a directory smartproxy.migrations that contains some files. Uh, these are the migrations, and you can see that uh, each scenario can have its own set of migrations. The migrations are simple Ruby scripts that are run in order to modify uh, the scenario file or the answer files. Uh, I can show you how, how the migration looks like. So the migration uh, works with uh, two entities. One is scenario, which is the scenario uh, data, and the other is answers. Uh, both of the entities contains hash that describes uh, or it's it's equal to, to the YAML file that we are uh, seeing in the in the listing. Uh, so in, in this in this uh, migration, I'm adding new new module, which is uh, for my proxy Ebert to to the mapping of the scenario, and I'm also uh, enable it in in the answer file, which is here. Now I can show you that uh, in the uh, in the current uh, current scenario there is no no Ebert mention and uh, if I run the installer it's from before so it should finish pretty quickly. Okay, it's finished. It's finished with error that says it cannot register to foreman, which is which is okay for this demo. Uh, and we can check uh, we can check our listing, and you can see that in the smart proxy migrations directory there is new file uh, applied, which contains listing of the migrations that were run. Uh, if we check the scenario and see that uh, there is new entry in mapping uh, that contains the Eber plugin just result of running of one migration and uh, we can also check uh, answer file and we can see that uh, there was also edit uh, this uh, Ebert module and uh, installer actually run it so it was executed and and the values were added to the to the answer file and that's it do you have any questions or points um, nothing at the moment I don't think so thank you very much Martin um, so that's technically the end of the demo. However, we have a last minute entry from Justin, who I don't have a slide for, uh, who wants to give us a very quick update on the uh, the host facet stuff. So, uh, Justin, you've got a bit of time. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, can you see my screen now? 
Yes, that's fine. Perfect. Um, so as part of the host unification, um, we had a, a, a large goal of, of moving the Catello content host onto the host object with all of its attributes. So instead of having two completely different uh, objects, you have a single object. And as part of this, uh, um, we needed a way for plugins to extend the host object in a variety of ways. Um, and this, the variety of ways that are called facets. And so now with a plugin, um, with, with the work that is currently merged into uh, Form and Develop, um, you can extend the Ravel APIs. So here we're looking at the host list, and we've actually added some content and subscription attributes. Uh, you can also, if we look at an individual one, uh, you can see additional attributes are added. So we have the ability to provide a slimmed down index view as well as a more detailed uh, show view. And so it, uh, the, the facet part is merged, but the actual Catello usage of it is not quite yet. Uh, but so what this allows us to do is actually even migrate the content host UI over to the hosts. So what you're looking at here now is actually uh, the host API rather than the old Catello systems API, which is deprecated. Uh, and you'll, you'll see this continue to, to integrate into the host's object uh, as we move along. And that's all. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Justin. Um, so that concludes our demo today. Once again, apologies for the late start. Um, thanks very much to all the presenters. And um, if you do have any further comments or questions, we can take this to IRC or to the discussion thread on the mailing list. And um, we will see you all in another three weeks for another community demo. Thanks very much, guys.